<laughs> Fabio, why is the testing so inconsistent in a nutshell? Because the accuracy is low for antibody testing, there is a high rate of false positives, and for the viral testing, there is a high rate of false negatives. All right, Andrew, so I put together this presentation to try and um, clarify and understand the um, testing issue. Testing for the SARS-CoV-2 virus is uh, used for several reasons. We use the test to confirm a diagnosis of COVID-19, to determine the spread of COVID-19 in the community, to estimate how many people will get sick and how many will die from COVID-19. We also use testing to understand what populations are more at risk based on factors like age, sex, ethnicity, socioeconomic status. Um, we uh, increasingly trying to use testing, especially antibody testing, to identify asymptomatic carriers. And all of this data allows us um, to make decisions on quarantine, lockdowns, and reopening strategies. So it's a big deal. It is a big deal. However, what we need to remember is that accurate testing relies on a number of key factors. First of all, do we know to uh, diagnose accurately infections from COVID-19? Do we fully understand the clinical course of the infection, the duration of the asymptomatic period, duration of symptoms, and the viral shedding after the symptoms go away? More yeah. importantly, are the tests that we use accurate? And finally, are we applying the correct statistical methods? Right. So these are a lot of factors. And um, I thought that for this presentation, we should really focus only on testing as a standalone and the potential pitfalls. And really, our understanding of the disease at this point is quite limited. It only and majorly comes from cases with an acute respiratory syndrome, syndrome, and particularly from severe cases that have been requiring hospitalization and or ventilation. Whereas if you look at the media there, and uh, um, uh, social media blogs, there is a, an emerging picture that this infection is much more chronic, systemic, and insidious um, in a larger number of patients and a growing number of patients, which makes diagnosis very difficult. But let's focus on testing for now. So on the basis of testing and uh, clinical features, we have three categories of uh, uh, certainty. So we have confirmed cases, we have probable cases, and we have uh, cases that uh, are based on vital records criteria. So the confirmed cases are those cases that meet confirmatory laboratory evidence. This means that patients have symptoms consistent with an acute severe respiratory syndrome plus a positive test to COVID-19. More often, this is a viral test rather than an antibody test. And we'll talk about the differences between the two in a minute. Probable cases meet critical clinical criteria and epidemiological evidence. Epidemiological evidence is basically saying, I have um, acute respiratory disease syndrome, plus I have a friend, a relative, um, somebody I know that had the same symptoms and had a confirmed diagnosis. You can have presumptive laboratory evidence, so, uh, uh, a laboratory antibody test and clinical criteria or epidemiological evidence. So as you can see from this classification, the antibody test is treated with a level of suspicion, right? By itself, it doesn't really give you a confirmed case. Why is that? Okay. Antibody testing 
uh, different from viral testing as a high rate of false positives. Viral testing has a high rate of false negatives. So this is, this is what's really difficult for me to understand is just how you take a, you do an antibodies test and you have such a high likelihood of getting it wrong. Because when I think of an antibody test, I think, oh, you draw the blood and you, know, you put it under a microscope and you see, oh, there, there's COVID-19 right there. You know, you just, you can like visually, even though I know it's so tiny, but the idea in my mind is you see it. You can't, if, if, it's, if you see it, how can you say that that's a false positive test? Because that's not the antibody test. That's a viral test. Uh, okay. That's what we use as a confirmatory test. So the antibody test is like, it's the difference between you being robbed, right? So you go to your house and uh, you find the, the door open and somebody got in and stole everything. It's a difference between you actually seeing the person that robbed you or you going there and finding somebody, a bystander, and say, did you see anyone um, coming out of my house? And the answer could be yes or could be no, but you never have a complete certainty that the answer is accurate. Does it make sense? Yes. Because it's a, it's a by event. It's not, it's not, again, it's not actually going on the microscope and seeing the virus. It's looking for a biological event that you expect to happen if the virus comes in contact with the immune system. Right, right. And the antibodies don't necessarily, they, 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 indicate, they indicate a specific attack happened, but it's not- the Antibodies are specific to COVID-19, to this virus. So they're not gonna pick up a different virus, right? But they are not gonna be able to always pick it up accurately. So you actually take blood, you spin off the serum, you put it on an immunoabsorbent um, uh, membrane that has the antigen that you presume is expressed, is bound by, to the antibody, is recognized by the antibody. And, then, and when the antibody binds to that, to that um, membrane, you have a positive result. If the okay. antibody doesn't bind to the membrane, you have a negative result. Got it. So that's so. There's a lot of room for some sort of error to happen in that process, is what. Right. Thing. Okay. So that's why the antibodies test is, is is not super accurate. And especially if they haven't been tested well, if they haven't been validated well. Okay. And finally, there is a third class of classifications, which is vital records criteria. So these are patients that died and the physician made uh, on the basis of the symptomatology and clinical characteristics at the moment of death, made an assumption that either uh, SARS-CoV-2 was a cause of death or it was a significant contributor to death. But essentially, the message here is that confirmed cases only include those with a, with a positive laboratory test. So we mentioned false positives and false negatives, and I wanted to explain a little bit more. So all diagnostic tests operate within a margin of error. This is why diagnostic tests normally require ex extensive validation across different laboratories, different populations, age group, ethnicities, conditions, uh, concomitant conditions, the immunological status of the patients, geography and sampling procedures. Broadly, this hasn't happened for COVID-19 because most tests have been granted emergency status from the FDA and the rest of the regulatory agencies and normally would expect a much higher um, standard for approving a test. So the margin of error of these tests is greater depending on the population, 
and how common the condition being tested. So if a condition only affects 5% of the population, the chances that the test might be giving you wrong um, results is higher than if the proportion of the, uh, if 50% uh, uh, of the people, population have the same condition. So the rarer the condition, the more likely the test is to give you uh, false results. Even the very best tests, uh, even the ones that we use routinely, uh, have both false positive and false negative results. So for instance, that's why if people take an HIV test and the test can, can, comes back positive, the test will be requiring a confirmatory test. So an antibody test will require a confirmatory test, which would be a, a viral test to actually check if the virus is actually in the body. Because there are cases in which the antibody test comes positive, but then there is no actual infection. And that's called a false positive. So a false positive is when the test results comes out positive, but the real result is negative. While the false negative is when the test result is negative, but the real result is positive. So I divided this between antibody testing and viral testing. Let's talk about antibody testing. The most majority of available tests claim between 90 and 100% specificity, which means that up to 10% of the people that have antibodies are not identified as positive. And they have between 80 and 100% sensitivity, which means that up to 20% of people that are identified as positive are in fact negative. Because SARS-CoV-2 has only spread to five 30% of the population, the results of the antibody testing are more likely to be many false positives and therefore underestimate the real morbidity, morbidity and mortality rates. So, so right. a specific test is a test that will actually um, accurately test for antibodies to coronavirus. Right. The sensitivity is the ability of the test to accurately only identify people that have coronavirus. Because the spread is documented between five to 30% of the population, this falls within the margin of error of that 20%. Wow. Right. I, I see what you're saying. I see what Does you're saying. Does it make sense now? So it's not, li it's not likely that they're all false positives, but it's it, it just the margin of error statistically is Possible. Is, is so wide that it's possible, which means it's not very accurate. I extracted this from Scientific American from uh, May of this year. Uh, there was an article that was talking exactly about this problem with antibody testing. So you can see the different definitions. Um, um, if you are positive and test positive, you look like this. If you're negative and test negative, you look like this. But if you are a false negative, you look like this, and if you are a false positive, you look like this. Okay. So a test with a low rate of false positives has high specificity. A test with a low rate of false negatives has a high sensitivity. Got it. So here we assume that a test has 95% specificity and 95% sensitivity, which to the standards of coronavirus antibody testing is very high. It's higher than what we have. It's higher than we have at the moment. So if we use this test in a community of 500 people with a 5% infection rate, the uh, results would look like this. You would have essentially an individual who tests negative as a 99.8% chance of actually being negative there is still a 0.2% chance of being positive. However, an individual that has the test positive, in this case, 
only has a 50% chance of actually being positive. Wow. Right? Wow. So, so it's 50, 50, even with an, even with a test that's better than what we have right now. Mm -hmm. Assuming a high percentage, as I said, it's all about the community, the, the size of the community, the infection rate, the actual infection rate, and the test sensitivity and specificity. So there are key factors that work together here. So if a similar accurate test in a community of 25 people with a 25% infection rate, instead the results look like this. You have the probability of a test, an individual that tests negative has a 98.3% chance of actually being negative. There's still a 0.7% chance that they are actually positive. But for a- 1.7%, one one you mean, right? 1.7%, yes. Yeah. Uh, but for an individual that tests positive, there is still a 13% chance that they will be actually negative. Wow. And this is with a 25% infection rate. Okay. Right? So, for example, um, Santa Clara County, right, yep. um, reported um, an infection rate of about 3%. The test used there claimed to have a sensitivity, a specificity around 98.5%. Uh, because of this, this means potentially that everybody that tested positive in Santa Clara County could have actually been a negative. With such high, with such high, even though they had such, such a high um, specificity rate? Yes, because the in infection rate, if accurate, it's within the margin of error of the test because that's a 2% chance, right? Wow. So this is why antibody testing really has very little value taken by itself at an individual level because the results are taken outside of the population context that determines the real likelihood of positivity versus negativity. It's still so hard for, for me to understand this. I, I... I would imagine that would be consistently accurate, you know, based on how accurate the test is, not based on how many people in the population are infected. Well, it's a little bit like roulette. Let me give you an example, right? With roulette or blackjack, you have a probability, right? You have, with a roulette, you have a probability one in 36 that you're gonna catch the right number. If you play only 36 times, you're not guaranteed, you're not guaranteed at all that you will win once, right? Because it's a statistical number. So what the number gives you is a probability. It's not a certainty. Right. Right? So it's still probable that you will get a point, even if a test has 98.5% and only a 1.5% margin of error, it doesn't mean that if you repeat the test um, 15 times, right, or 150 times, you're gonna get the right result. It's still a chance that depends on the size of the population, it depends on the overall spread and probability of the disease, and depends on the sensitivity in itself. So there are different factors that play with it. So that's why you need a very accurate test before a small population would give you any, any real numbers. Right, and that's why accurate testing is developed over a number of years with real populations expanding and um, uh, across many different laboratories that can independently verify the results. Mm -hmm. And even in that case, 
there are still false positives and false negatives. So in, in Santa Clara County, there was a single test that was used from a single manufacturer. And already we see that that causes a problem. In large cohorts uh, that are independently placed and kind of collected through a central agency by different companies, um, you might have different tests being used. And each of those tests would have the same problem. Each will have a specific a specificity and a sensitivity which is intrinsic to the test itself. So when you mash them all together, you basically take, instead of having to play with one roulette, you actually then play with 10 roulettes. So the overall specificity and sensitivity is no longer the one of the test with the highest probability, but it's actually an average of all of the tests with lower and higher probabilities. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. So that brings your specificity and sensitivity down essentially further. So okay. the potential for falsehood rates increases exponentially. The more different tests you use, the more likely you have false false results. Wow. So so but they but you said that they only used one, they only used they used the same test, right? The same test manufacturer. Would so you're saying that wouldn't that increase sensitivity then? It depends. This is a very so let's go back to this one, right? This is a very accurate test. And they test 500 people with a 25% infection rate. You still have a 13% chance more than one in 10 individuals would test positive and in fact be negative. Or how it comes back positive when it's, when it's really negative um, so many times. From a biological perspective, there may be cross reactivity with other antibodies, there might be a chance that the individual has individual, you know, kind of antibodies that um, natural antibodies that strong, strongly resemble those of the disease that you're trying to identify, but uh, they're not quite the same. Uh, you might have individuals with a screwed up immune system and uh, a number of old antibodies, and therefore they're more reactive than the average for the normal population. Um, there are hundreds, millions of reasons why. Okay. That's why, you know, it's, it's so difficult. As I said, even HIV, which is an antibody test that has been present for, for 30 years, right? It's been used routinely for 30 years, and we make a lot of clinical decisions around that. It requires a confirmatory test in order to kind of proceed and say, yes, you're really positive. Because you can definitely get a false positive with... Because you can still get a false positive. Right. It's inherent. There is no 100% accurate test. Right. In any disease, in any, in any form, shape, or, you know, there is no such a thing as, as certainty when it comes to biology. Right. Okay? Gotcha. It's a statistical certainty, which doesn't mean that it's an actual certainty. Now we are talking about Diagnostic testing, the other type of test, which is diagnostic testing or viral testing. This is what, this is essentially the swab that is inserted in your nose that is really painful. Mm -hmm. And uh, that actually gives you, to your question earlier, that tells you that the virus is there. This is not a bystander, this is not a by event, this is the virus itself, you see it there. And the way we look at it, it's by RT-PCR. So we take, we look at viral RNA through an amplification process so that we can actually perceive it because the amounts can be so small that they're very difficult to pick up. Um, however, also these tests can be inaccurate. Um, again, a false positive could result um, in uh, labeling a person as infected with consequences because these patients would get quarantined. They're not classed as uh, healthy carriers or uh, asymptomatic or past exposures. They, uh, they classed as infected because the virus is there. Right. False negatives 
are also more consequential because an infected person who might, might not be asymptomatic might not be isolated and therefore can go out and infect others. So diagnostic testing, viral testing has been put through a number of studies uh, starting in China and then also here in the US, in Italy, in all of the countries where uh, coronavirus has been spreading. And uh, um, where, whereas with um, uh, viral testing, the number of uh, false positives is very low. So not many people test positive but are in fact negative. The because because people, that viral replication method is so accurate. I mean, it's, it gets, exactly. you know, if, if the virus replicates in the Petri dish, it's like, wow, how could that, how could that have happened if it weren't there, right? It's there. It's got to be there because it's very, very specific. Right. But, um, a false, but a false negative could occur if you just, if the swab didn't, didn't get any part of the body that currently had virus. In it. Right. It's, and that's approximately 30%. So the 30, wow. up to 30 um, out of 100 um, tests can be false negatives. Wow. So this explains it a bit. I don't know whether this is too technical again, but it's essentially the same as we were talking before, but in a different graphic representation. So if you say that, um, um, you know, the, the line is uh, you be, you're not infected, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you have a, a certain, a reasonable certainty that you're not infected. Um, depending on whether you, you use a high specificity or a high sensitivity test or a low sensitivity specificity test, your chance that uh, um, you actually are infected change considerably, vary between 15 and 33%. Wow. So even in this case, it's possible that you are detected as a false negative, even with the most accurate tests, but you might have a chance, or up to a chance in three, to actually be positive and therefore go, to, go visit your grandmother and kind of give a coronavirus. The most accurate way to estimate the number of cases, hospitalizations of death, and that is the confirmed cases number, measured by RT-PCR nasopharyngeal swab. It is true that this test has a high rate of false negatives, but it also has a very low rate of false positives, which is more conservative and gives you almost a best case scenario. I put worst case scenario there, but it is actually the best case scenario, which means that it's it actually gives you a lower rate of infection than the normal one, right? Gotcha. According to this, if you look at confirmed cases versus confirmed deaths, right? And we looked at the criteria before, the mortality rate for coronavirus infections amongst the confirmed cases is one to 5%. I actually looked at New York, and New York actually comes, when, you can, when we only count in confirmed cases, around 7%. So statistics in Italy come to about 10%. Okay. This number does not include probable cases or clinical infections that present without severe acute respiratory syndrome, unless the test positive. Okay. So this is, Typical symptomatology, positive test. Got it. Antibody testing has really not gone through rigorous vetting. And I find that it is dangerous to draw conclusions, both from a personal or population perspective. False positives are common, which lead to an overestimation, an overestimation of the number of asymptomatic carriers, which means that the um, number of deaths is underestimated. 
So yeah, this is this is really helpful because I was looking at this worldometers numbers here, and basically I what I was seeing was was this that basically they said based on this uh, study in New York, mm -hmm. they were determining, um, and they only, t I guess they tested 15,000 people at grocery stores and community centers across the state over preceding two weeks. Mm -hmm. um, and the, it came up with a 19.9% .9 of the population uh, of New York had COVID-19 antibodies based on that 15,000 subset group, I believe. Right. So, so, that, so from that, they're extrapolating that that if that's true, if that's consistent, then one in one point six million people would have already been infected. How, right. how is that accurate? Well, you can see now that we have actually that conversation, but that sounds a little strange, right? For a number of yeah. reasons. So, primary, primarily, you extra, you know, we extrapolate from fifteen thousand, one or three. 103 tests that tested positive in 12.3% uh, of the population in New York State and 19.9% of the population in New York City, we extrapolate that that number is valid across the entire uh, New York population. Instead, that number represents 0.7% of the entire population of New York State, less than 1%. Right. So remember the sensitivity and specificity um, yeah. figures that if you have less than the representation, then you're likely that all of your numbers might be, all your positive might be negative. I mean, I think that would be very unlikely too, that all positives would be negative, right? right. But still, if your margin of error is what is larger than the entire test sample group then your numbers are just soft as soft as can be exactly so the those numbers assume a minimum uh, uh, sensitivity for those tests of 87.7 percent and 80.1 percent respectively so they should have tested at least 20% of the population to draw those which, conclusions. Which would be, which would be four, oh, if we're looking for the state, it would be four million people, right? Approximately four million people. <laughs> so this is basically, what you're saying is this is, this is essentially almost useless numbers. It's, I mean, a, it's a direct extrapolation with no real statistical power of uh, uh, a sample testing. The other wow. problem with this is that these 15,000 people, because they were tested across the state and with yeah. different testing methodologies, again, the more tests you use, the more you multiply the margin of error and the more you know, inaccurate the results will be. So while it might be that some of those patients are really positive that being exposed, I think that 20% is a wild guess. It's really an excessive um, okay. statement. So, and so what, what would you, if we were gonna try to guess at what, um, with harder numbers, what we're looking at as far as the overall death rate, right. what, what would you look at? Well, again, you know, here they, they, they played clever in a way, in the sense that they said, okay, I'm, I'm gonna take the largest number of infections that I can get, right, based on my extrapolation, and I'm gonna match it with the largest number of deaths that I can get. So here, they not only use the confirmed deaths that we talked about earlier, right, those with the confirmed laboratory tests and clinical symptoms, um, but they also take the probable deaths. So those that the doctor says, mm, I think this person died of coronavirus, or those that had non-complete evidence, right? And then they take the third piece of data, which is something that you and I spoke, spoke, spoke about before, which is the uh, excess death rate. So 
that looks at the overall population in a, in a region and says, I expect, based on statistical epidemiological data collected across years, they said, I expect this number of people to die uh, in this period. And instead, you have an excess of those numbers. So, and they take the excess deaths. So, they add in, by adding the number of confirmed deaths, probable deaths, and excess deaths, they come to this 23,000, uh, this number of 23,000. Right. Which is almost twice the uh, number of deaths. So then they, to uh, determine the infection fatality, fatality rate, they take the total number of deaths presumptive and confirmed and the total number of exposures according to the extrapolated um, antibody testing performed on 0.7% of the population. And they come up with this matching number, which is 1.4%. Infection fatality rate. Yes. Okay. In reality, if you only use confirmed cases and confirmed deaths, you have 166,883 confirmed cases at May 1st and 13,156 deaths that gives you an approximate uh, infection death rate of uh, 7%. Wow. Instead of 1.4. Instead of 1.4. So it's going to be somewhere between those numbers. The question is where? Well, we don't know yet because we still don't know how many patients are actually infected with coronavirus, how many patients develop symptoms that are both consistent with the acute um, severe respiratory syndrome that gives the name to the virus and how many have atypical symptoms or die for other causes. Again, in other venue, we talked about deaths that occur for cardiovascular reasons, strokes, because of the mechanism of action of the virus. We're not counting those. These patients are not getting tested, or if they're getting tested, they have a 40% chance of being negative and even higher, because one thing that we didn't talk about is that the viral testing also works in a window. So if you take it too late, you're not going to detect the virus in the nasopharyngeal swab anymore because the virus is migrated in other parts of the body. Right. So now they're talking about more accurate viral testing through um, um, feces analysis. So mm -hmm. by analyzing the feces, you can actually test more, more accurately whether a virus is still in the body because, you know, even if you can test it in the mouth or in the nasopharynx, it's going to come out somewhere if it's around there. Mm -hmm.